Hello, I'm uh, Paul Robinson, and um, this is a, a talk on specialist support of clinical management. Um, it's the broad version. Uh, the original version I'll explain to you was to do with anorexia mostly, and this uh, applies to all eating disorders. So I'm a <clears throat> consultant psychiatrist and a professor of teaching at U University College London and ORI UK. And that's my email address if you want to contact me. So the programme today, um, uh, first of all, I'm going to be talking about general principles, the history, development of, and principles of SSCM, Specialist Supportive Clinical Management, the training uh, this session is a start, um, the uh, pract practicing basic techniques of SSCM and managing specific issues in SSCM, as well as using the education worksheets that are provided. Um, and then I'm going to describe a workshop, which you don't have to do, but um, if there's, if you can get three of you together um, uh, watching this uh, video, then it's a good idea to do the workshop and see how it goes. So first of all, general principles. So what is SSCM? Where did it come from? Um, that's what it stands for, Specialist Supportive Clinical Management. Uh, it has its origin in the University of Otago in New Zealand and in North Carolina in America. Uh, and uh, in the study that was um, shared by those um, two uh, universities, uh, SSCM was the control treatment and it was test being tested against CBT and interpersonal therapy for anorexia nervosa. However, in the trial, SSCM did rather well. And this is a quote from the trial, where SSCM was associated with a more rapid response than IPT. By follow-up, all three treatments were indistinguishable. And so for that reason, um, SSCM um, was sort of elevated from being a, a controlled treatment uh, to, uh, to being a treatment in its own right. And that's why I'm talking about it today. So what are the characteristics of SSCM? First of all, SSCM is for anorexia nervosa and SSCM B broad is for all eating disorders. First of all, there's the symptom focus. Um, so focus on factors leading to weight loss, for example, um, on um, helping the patient regain weight and on reduction of bulimic symptoms. And the non-specific factors which are um, characteristic of all, eat, uh, all uh, psychotherapies uh, using the therapeutic relationship to maintain engagement and to maintain compliance with treatment. Uh, at the bottom there you see uh, a typical um, uh, a trajectory of a, of a patient having uh, SSCM um, with um, bulimia nervosa, their binging and vomiting gets better, then it relapses in the middle, it doesn't always have to, but it can do, and then it gets better again by the end. And in the weight chart, similar thing, uh, the weight goes up and it plateaus and then uh, goes up a bit. Um, and um, uh, so uh, one thing that's been uh, um, observed by a number of people, um, including myself actually, um, uh, learning about SSCM, is that it's uh, really what we do anyway. Um, it's what nurses, um, um, uh, dietitians, uh, all sorts of uh, people who work with eating disorders do um, when they're not doing a specific um, uh, 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 therapy such as um, CBT or IPT or mantra. So um, in a way, I mean, that's um, in a way that's a good thing because we already know how to do it. It's what we do. Um, and um, it also gives it uh, gives um, what is normally done by people who don't have a massive um, psychotherapy training uh, um, a bit more dignity. Um, and that um, you know, I've worked in in units where um, there were a large number of nurses, all of whom did this, um, and um, we never had a name for it in those days. But now we do. It's called SSCM. And um, I think that's a good thing. Um, so I wouldn't let that put you off, uh, that it's something we do anyway. I think that's a real advantage. 
Okay, so the general model is a psychoeducation and gentle coaching, um, advice, education, encouragement, and support, rapport rather than transference, and the evidence base is, is the supportive therapy model, for which there is um, something of a, of a literature. And there's Rosie the Riveter down there, we can do it. So it might not be your style, but uh, it's certainly some, some people's style. You see the New Zealand cricket uh, team belt down there. Um, SSCM was developed for treatment of anorexia nervosa in the Otago study. And I developed um, SSCMB broad uh, in collaboration with the original SSCM team for all eating disorders, specifically for the Nourish study. The Nourish study, um, it was published in 2016 and it um, compared SSCM with mentalization based therapy. Um, <clears throat> and the reasoning uh, at the time, the reasoning of, of our team um, doing that, the Nourish study, was that um, although patients with anorexia nervosa clearly need to gain weight, they also often have binging and purging. And so um, it seemed to me and seemed to us that the, the, the same principles could apply um, in um, bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. Um, for, for treatment of those conditions. So who can provide uh, SSCM uh, broad? Well, first of all, you, you should have a, a basic mental health training, such as uh, mental health nursing, psychiatry, psychology, occupational therapy, dietetics, or any of the other mental health trainings that, uh, that are around. Um, the main thing is that you have um, uh, treated people with uh, mental health conditions. Um, some places do use assistant psychologists um, and uh, because the assistant psychologists are usually so bright because um, they've usually got very good degrees and they're often on the way to um, um, so, um, uh, to psychology to um, uh, clinical psychology training. Uh, but um, they're junior and they need close supervision if you, if you do that. You have to have at least six months working with uh, eating disorder patients so you know what sort of people you're dealing with and what sort of problems they have. You have to be under expert supervision. And uh, regarding the training, um, this um, lecture is part of a half day training and uh, some of the SSEM practitioners believe that that's not enough and they recommend a, a two-day training. Um, however, there, is, there are no formal rules and my advice is um, to do the half-day training and um, if uh, then to start um, applying the um, approach and if you or your supervisor thinks that you should have more then get some more training. So how much, how often, how long? Um, the the uh, original SSCM suggested 20 sessions of 30 to 60 minutes. Um, in the Nourish study, we were treating people with quite complex eating disorders, uh, often a combination of bulimia nervosa and um, emotionally unstable or borderline personality disorder. And we found that uh, there was plenty to talk about for 50 minutes. We chose 50 minutes not because uh, we're analytically um, inclined, but because uh, it's a good idea to have 10 minutes in between sessions and you have your sessions on the hour. Very practical. Um, now the spacing, initially you do one session a week, but you'll see, uh, and the total duration is up to a year, but you'll see uh, 20 sessions, uh, one a week, uh, would uh, not last a year. So you do the first few, a few say 10 sessions weekly, uh, that's, that's not a rule, that's, that's your decision. And then you start to spread them out uh, until they last the year, um, going to fortnightly and then going to uh, monthly. Now, if at the end of the year, uh, the patient sort of just about, just started to get it, just started to improve, um, and um, uh, you discuss in your supervision that um, it would re really be a pity to lose this opportunity to make significant improvement, 
then um, we say that uh, up to five sessions, extra sessions are allowed after the uh, 20 that have been administered. What about monitoring and supervision? Well, our advice is to audio or video record at least some sessions. And the reasons for the recordings are, first of all, supervision. You bring the recording to supervision and there's nothing like hearing or seeing, especially seeing um, uh, a therapy to uh, be able to see what's going on and hear. Um, model adherence, uh, the supervisor needs to be clear that uh, you're doing SSCM and not some other therapy uh, that you've learned. And th thirdly, SSCM is a fairly a recently developed therapy and um, it certainly is in development phase. And so there's no reason why um, practitioners shouldn't add to it and, um, and modify it. So I think model development is an important um, uh, reason for recording. Uh, you do supervision in a group with a trained supervisor. Now a trained supervisor is someone who's uh, done a, an SSCM course and has treated um, a, a patient with SSCM for at least uh, six months and also is in a senior position in the team. Um, so um, the supervision is for one to one and a half hours um, every one to four weeks. In the, in what we did in the, in the study was um, one and a half hours every week. Um, and um, we made sure that every case was presented at least once every four weeks because we had quite a few practitioners in the, in the groups and they couldn't all talk about their patient, all their patients every week. But that's the minimum you have to um, abide by. Okay, general point about SSCM, no interruptions during sessions, appointments, as I said, 30 to 60 minutes, but I do strongly advise uh, 50 minutes. Um, you try and minimize phone and email contact. You don't have long conversations on the phone or long emails between you and the, and the patient. Try and keep the uh, contact, the phone contact to less than 10 minutes per week and one or two emails. And clearly you treat you you tailor your treatment for each patient depending on what their problems are and we're going to be talking about that presently so be, the initial phase first of all is the therapeutic alliance which is um, in, vital in all all therapies basically you've got to persuade the patient that uh, you know what you're talking about and um, you're um, a nice person, that they like you, uh, that always helps, um, and that um, you're going to be able to help them. I mean, that's really what the Therapeutic Alliance is about, and then they'll come and see you. Uh, you, talk, you talk to the patient about the treatment, about what SSCM means, what it stands for, etc. And then you ask the patient to say uh, what their uh, problems are. You don't have to take a full history, you don't have to do sort of, you know, childhood history, um, all, the, all those aspects of a full history, but you really want to know what the difficulties are. Is the difficulty about weight, is it about body image, is it about binging, is it about vomiting, laxity, etc. So find out what all the symptoms are. And while you're hearing about them, um, think about the targets to the list. And the target symptom list is a, a list of um, symptoms that you're going to be dealing with in SSCM. Um, uh, so, um, uh, for example, you, you'll be encouraging normal eating, reducing bulimic symptoms, um, gaining weight if it's necessary, and also addressing uh, some non-eating disorder symptoms, which we'll, we'll come to. So this... Um, target symptom list is an absolute crucial, absolutely crucial aspect of SSCM. So what you do um, with the, um, in the middle of that SSCM, say you've, uh, you've, you've taken a few, say three, two, two to three weeks to develop the target symptom list. Um, you um, work on each target symptom. Um, you attempt to resolve the symptoms or at least make progress and you work intensively for about 10 to 15 sessions and then around session 10 um, 
you schedule a review session. What do you do there? So this is the review session um, with the patient, with the therapist, of course. Uh, also, the supervisor can come um, and um, the uh, patient may bring a support, such as a friend or relative. And you review general progress and attendance um, and uh, review all the target symptoms and any changes that have uh, occurred and address any problems in progress. Say the patient hasn't turned up to some sessions or is constantly late. How do you address them? Is there a change in time would be useful? Um, would, it, would they uh, appreciate shorter sessions? Find, find a way to, uh, to, to stand with the patient and make it possible for them to accept your treatment. And then the final phase, which is termination, um, where um, you prepare the patient for um, uh, leaving the therapy. And you do that partly by uh, reducing the frequency of sessions. So it, uh, it'll be every fortnight and eventually every, every month. And you, um, uh, you talk about the future, um, you know, how are they going to manage afterwards? Uh, have they got any symptoms that need, need management? How are they going to do that without therapy? Are there any uh, other places they can go to? Um, and um, how would they manage relapse? And so that's um, part of the future focus. So the, the, just to go, go through the tasks, um, first of all, establish the therapeutic alliance, explain what SSCM is, develop and agree the target symptom list, work on the target symptom list, review and ad adapt, continue the target symptom list work and prepare for the end of therapy. That's, those are your ta tasks. So in this second um, uh, uh, section, I'm going to be talking about practicing the basic techniques. Um, I've, I've sort of slightly rushed over them in the first session just to tell you, um, to, to give you a thumbnail sketch of SSCM, but here I'm going to go in a bit more detail. So these are the, thing, these are the things you need to practice. Uh, first of all, engagement, explaining SSCM, creating a target symptom list, helping with weight gain, helping with bulimic symptoms, helping with other target symptoms and ending therapy. So engagement, make sure you're, the timing, the room, the reception, the waiting space is all okay. Um, give a warm welcome to the patient. Uh, it is important to come over um, warmly to the patient um, and um, Maybe not in COVID you'd shake hands, but otherwise you might do or you might not, depending on what you feel. Make sure the patient is comfortable. Introduce yourself. Uh, to say a little bit about your training, about your background. Um, ask the patient something about themselves in a, in a general sort of social way. Have they had treatment before as well? And explain that the treatment is called SSCM and you're going to describe it. So explaining SSCM. So first of all, um, you need to let the patient know that SSCM for eating disorders has been shown in many studies to be an effective treatment. You also want, may want to mention that it's uh, uh, recommended uh, by the uh, National Institute of um, Clinical and, and, and Care Excellent, Excellence, NICE. Uh, and, and that's um, some patients may may not know what that means but uh, you can explain that uh, explain what uh, the word the words mean um, talk about the length and the frequency of sessions as i've talked about the length of treatment the worksheets which we'll come to and explain the target symptom list so the target symptom list i'm going to go in a little bit more detail here on the right you can see actually it's a screenshot of my phone um, showing the target symptoms, uh, which are regular eating, gain some weight, reduce over exercise, and talk about eating with mum. Um, uh, these are th things that the patient has brought up that uh, they want to deal with. Um, a couple of others which are in the to be discussed list, which are reduce alcohol and stop viewing in the gram. And these are things that I've thought were probably relevant. 
uh, but the patient disagreed, and so we put them in the to be discussed list. Okay, so I'm coming back to the um, um, instruction, you take a history of the problems, which I talked about. As the issues come up, make a note uh, of things that might come into the target symptom list, weight loss, binge eating, vomiting, exercise. Then discuss with the patient what he or she thinks should be on the list. Um, and if there are symptoms on your list that don't appear, like the ones in the to be discussed list, raise them and suggest they might be on the list. And if the patient says, no, no, no not at the moment, thank you, you, you do some negotiation and, and you may end up placing the symptom on the provisional uh, to be discussed list. Okay, so here's a, 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 that's a, that's a therapist thinking of a, a patient who's reached normal weight, uh, very hopeful. Um, so the example of the list made by the therapist, irregular meals, inadequate nutritional intake, low weight, binge eating, vomiting, excess exercise. And here's the patient um, who's got an even thinner image of herself than um, uh, in the future than, uh, than she even is. Um, uh, so her list is irregular meals, binge eating, vomiting, and social life, social problems. So those are the things that, the pa those are the patient's priorities. And somehow, and that's the skill really, um, and, the re and, and using the relationship positively is to try and bring these two lists together. So uh, here's, a, here's an example, of, another example of a target symptom list. Um, agreed would be irregular meals, inadequate nutritional intake, binge eating and vomiting. And to be discussed would be low weight and excess exercise. But um, you need to um, be clear with the patient that low weight will need to be discussed at some point, because if you um, are underweight and you don't re restore weight, uh, you don't recover from anorexia. So uh, that's, um, I think you've got to be honest with the patient and that has got to be at some point, something that you talk about. So uh, how do you use the target symptom list in therapy? So in each session, you decide which symptoms to discuss today. Um, during the session, you make a plan for what we're gonna talk about next time. And you develop aims for each of the symptoms discussed. And um, after, I said 10 sessions, but after it says after three months, you review each symptom and assess the progress or otherwise. That's the, uh, the review process. Okay, so here's the third um, section, which is managing specific issues. So the areas uh, we need to cover um, are engagement with therapy, weight, bulimic symptoms, over-exercising, and possibly substance misuse, definitely risk management, and ending therapy. So engagement with therapy, um, that picture at the bottom shouldn't be the way you are. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an anti illustration in a way. Um, so the patient misses sessions, is late or fails to do their homework. You talk about the problem, and you try a motivational enhancement approach. Um, some of you may be familiar with MET, Motivational Enhancement Therapy. And this is where you discuss the problem areas, say they're low weight or binging. So how serious are they? Um, maybe the low weight has landed you in hospital. And maybe you've got osteoporosis. Uh, maybe the binging has caused electrolyte problems or it has a dreadful effect on your, on your um, uh, occupational, academic and social life. So um, uh, talk about the seriousness of the problem and what will happen if they're not dealt with. You know, what, you, what will you be like in 10 years time if you don't deal with these problems? And um, once you've established that uh, you've agreed with the patient, hopefully, that um, uh, the problems are serious um, and they need to be dealt with, um, what about this approach and uh, what could be modified to make it more helpful? A uh, different time, for example, some people 
some patients um, uh, can't miss work and so they need um, special times early or late um, um, some people some some patients have uh, child care um, responsibilities and, and that needs to be addressed um, uh, so try to discuss how they could fit SSCM into their lives um, in a way so that they can start to uh, address the problem areas. So weight gain, um, you, you discuss the diet. Um, some people ask the patient to keep a dietary diary, but that can be problematic for obsessional restrictors. Um, where they, the diary becomes a sort of um, homework to excel at um, and it doesn't really help at all. It possibly makes things worse. Um, but then you uh, talk about weight gain and the reasons for it and the, again the motivational enhancement approach. And um, when you're talking about um, adding something, you would uh, say, look, look, what what meal could we have changed that would be most acceptable to you and what could we add to that meal that would be least scary for you so in other words start um, simple start low and build up and as i said uh, you use a motivational approach um, if they if you're lucky enough to get the patient near a healthy weight or if they start off near a healthy weight a bmi of over 18.5 and the patient a female patient is still not having periods you might want to discuss whether an ovary scan might be helpful because the ovary scan can let you know um, what stage of ovarian um, uh, um, anatomy the, um, uh, the patient is at. And uh, they may be quite far from menstruating or ovulating, or they might be just on the edge of it. And you can tell from the ovary scan. So discuss that with... Um, uh, with a doctor or with a, with a scanning department. Um, I usually think it's not useful to set a target weight uh, at the beginning of therapy. Uh, I generally work with a BMI in the normal range, 18.5 to 25, plus menstruation in females. Um, so that's, my, uh, that's what my aim would be. And you can share that with the patient. Okay, so bulimic symptoms. The approach is rather similar. Those of you who've done CBT-E um, or CBT-BN uh, will know that um, you ask the patient to keep a diary. Um, you note food, binges, restriction, vomiting, laxatives and exercise. And um, you try and, um, of course, it can be done online and emailed, especially nowadays. Um, and uh, you try and get the patient to um, establish three meals a day. Uh, especially uh, including some carbohydrate in the meals. Um, and uh, there's an example of a diary on the right. Uh, you'll see for each day, there's actually not much room. So you'll need to stretch um, each day. So there's enough room to put um, the food eaten on one day. Um, if the patient is underweight, um, uh, try and help them get to the normal range. And um, if the... Um, uh, if the patient relapses during therapy uh, and they've stopped the diary, then restart it and, uh, and, and, and start this again. Okay. So over-exercising. Again, uh, using a motivation enhancement approach, establish the reasons for change. Uh, you know, we all should exercise more. So what's wrong with um, running um, 20 miles every morning? Um, but in fact, if you're underweight and you've got nutritional problems, then exercise is really um, a danger. So you might want to ask the patient to keep a dietary diary briefly, so for a few days, uh, noting the exercise and make the link between uh, calories in and out. In other words, um, the amount of food they're having and the amount of exercise they're doing. I, you don't use that. I mean, some of you might wish to do this um, uh, to work out exactly what calories are coming in and going out. Um, but in general, uh, you can you can say, look, from on, on the diet you're having, there's no way that you have enough to um, um, uh, to uh, meet that amount of exercise. Um, and um, 
uh, what um, you'll you will need to try and reduce the exercise in a realistic way um, and increase the calories so that there's um, there's more of a balance between the two and uh, if the patient needs to gain weight which they often will in this situation the calories will need to go higher um, in order to um, facilitate weight gain and the, Towards the end of therapy, you can talk about a re-establishing healthy exercise um, because of, obviously there's nothing wrong with exercising, but the weight has to be normal, nutrition and, um, and the exercise have to, be, have to be improved. And then you can work out what a safe uh, way to exercise would be. And again, if, you, um, if the patient relapses, um, start restart the diary. But just as for um, restriction, sometimes um the, the diary can make obsessional exercise worse so if you notice that then probably best to dispense with the diary and just talk about it in general terms talk about exercise in general terms okay substance misuse um first of all it's not always appropriate to use sscm for substance misuse because if it's severe or the therapist is, is uh, inexperienced then um, you should be um, referring to the local substance misuse services if they would accept somebody um, um, who has that particular um, uh, misuse. Um, but if it's mild, occasional, then uh, you can add it to the target symptom list. Uh, for example, um, a patient who every Friday night uh, with a friend drink a bottle of wine and um, the patient then spends the night binging and vomiting because um, the patient's um, uh, inhibitions have been uh, reduced by the alcohol and the uh, bulimia has got worse. If that's happening, then it's perfectly reasonable to try and reduce the quantity of alcohol. Um, and if it's um, other drugs, then try and reduce those as well. And you can keep a diary of this, uh, put it on the diary if, that's, if that seems useful. Okay, <clears throat> risk management always needs to be there, especially um, in patients with uh, low weight, uh, uh, with anorexia nervosa, and also with bulimia nervosa. And the risk might be low weight and emaciation. It might be electrolyte imbalance, especially if the patient is vomiting or taking laxatives. But also self-harm and suicide are, um, uh, are, are risk factors. Um, remember that um, a proportion of patients who die from eating disorders take their own lives. And also risky behaviours. For example, <clears throat> a patient who is very vulnerable, who uh, goes out at night drinking and uh, gets into risky sexual situations, takes drugs, uh, that also has to be taken into account in the in the risk assessment. Discuss that with the wider team, for example, medical and, and more senior people um, in the team, and make sure the risk assessment and management plans are in place. Um, you can use the Marcipan risk assessment. In fact, that's now being, um, as, as I speak, in uh, March 2022, it's being re rewritten. It's almost finished and it's now being called MEAD because it's, go, it's for all eating disorders. So and MEAD stands for Medical Emergencies and Eating Disorders. Um, and that will be the new um, uh, risk assessment tool that we recommend, um, which is coming out in May of 2022. If the risk, if the risk is severe, consider whether this uh, approach is appropriate. Um, uh, if the therapist is very, is, uh, is very um, inexperienced um, or the, and, and if the risk is very high, um, they might need more intensive treatment such as daycare or um, inpatient care. And but that needs to be considered in, in cons consultation with the um, MDT. Um, however, if it's relatively mild, you can add the risk factor, for example, the potassium level to the target symptom list and possibly suggest a diary to uh, monitor it. 
ending therapy um, after the 20 sessions you can discuss in your supervision group whether five more would be appropriate the patient's making good progress in the middle of change and in the last three to four sessions talk about changes during therapy you know what's happened what's got better what's got not got better what's got worse um, how the patient is going to manage symptoms without therapy and how they're going to manage relapse if it unfortunately occurs um, discuss the strengths of the patient about what you've noticed and the challenges they might face um, look at their social network friends family um, other people and how, and how they might help with uh, preventing relapse or dealing with problems and use services such as charities such as beat who have a fantastic um, uh, website and uh, support services and um, in general uh, the internet can be helpful especially things like beat but be cautious i mean i found this on the internet get your personalized keto diet meal plan the patient needs to be cautioned against um, using um, uh, what might be called pro-anorexic um, types of advice even if they are not obviously pro-anorexic Okay, so this is the last uh, set section, which is using the education worksheets. And here, are, here they are. Sorry, there's loads of them, but I'll just read through them. What are eating disorders? How common are eating disorders? What causes eating disorders? The effects of dieting? Problems due to restriction, purging, and other eating disorder symptoms? Socio-cultural influences on eating disorders? The ineffectiveness of dieting? The ineffectiveness of weight loss medication, which includes uh, stimulant drugs, but also laxatives. The cycle of disordered eating, very important in bulimia. Uh, theories of uh, biological and genetic contributions to weight status and body shape. What are the scales really telling you? The consequences of eating disorders. Nutrition and recovery from eating disorders. Bone health, especially osteoporosis. And purging for weight control. The, uh, so-called purging disorder. Now you're not um, aiming to make the, make the patient into a PhD, but um, you use these uh, worksheets in, in specific ways, which I'll, I'll now describe. So the patient says, I can't increase what I eat because then my weight will go out of control. And you're sort of sympathetic to that. Okay, I appreciate you have that fear. However, we agreed, and um, you mentioned the target symptom list, that some weight gain was essential to your recovery. Have a look at sheet four, effects of dieting, it's only brief. And the first part of sheet five, problems due to restriction and, and weight loss. Which of these things apply to you? And let's discuss this next, uh, next session. And in the next session, the pros and cons of weight gain are discussed, and the patient cites some symptoms of restriction that she's experiencing that she recognizes from the uh, from the worksheet so it can be really helpful it's a sort of external opinion um, so it's not necessarily you saying it um, it's um, someone the person who's written the the worksheet and you can use that as a reference uh, within therapy and here's another one with binge eating the patient says i looked at the self-help manual and it wants me to eat more that's just not okay and the therapist says, I think you're saying that eating more might cause uh, you to, go, to gain weight. Of course it will. Um, and the therapist, however, you find yourself eating very little during the day and overeating at night, as you put in your diary. And this is what you wanted to reduce. Can I suggest you look at the worksheet nine, cycle of disordered eating, and we can discuss that again next time. Now, the next time the patient, uh, you say, um, did you have a look at the worksheet? What did you think? The patient says, well, it describes me absolutely. However, I still can't understand how restriction can cause binging, as it says. The therapist, okay, let's talk about that. And you start to talk about your, using your nutritional knowledge and your knowledge of eating disorders, how that, how that works. And this is, part of, this is part of the psychoeducation. It's very much part of uh, SSCM. And the subject comes up, you don't have a worksheet, so that I mentioned the alcohol, um, moderate alcohol use influencing eating disorder by reducing inhibitions. So you write it yourself or get someone else to write it. 
and send it to me and I'll put it in the manual and I'll attribute uh, your contribution. So this is quite a useful um, diagram to share with the patient. Uh, on the left hand side, there's all the etiological factors in the family, including genetic, then social life pressures to be thin, sociocultural, and personal um, perfectionism, um, obsessionality, all the things that uh, go up to make someone's personality, which might put them at risk for an eating disorder. This leads to the wish to lose weight, leads to dieting, and that causes both weight loss, <coughs> leading to anorexia nervosa, and binging, uh, which can also lead to anorexia nervosa, but also binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa. And these are the perpetuating factors, changes in hunger, for example, due to delayed gastric emptying, uh, depression, uh, some social withdrawal, fear of weight gain, and uh, urge to eat, partly because of the nutritional deficiencies. So that's quite useful to go through, and they can, uh, the patient can say, well, if this replies to me, but this doesn't, and that's, that's quite a useful thing. Okay, so now the workshop. Um, you don't, obviously, you don't have to do this, but if you can get three of you together to do this, it's quite useful. Okay, so Lucy is a 30-year-old administrative officer in a finance company who developed anorexia nervosa when she was 17 after her mother developed breast cancer. Her weight was very low, but um, she recovered after a hospital admission when she was 18. After discharge, she felt overweight, although her BMI was only 17.2. In order to keep her weight down, she began vomiting and exercising, and soon she was also overeating or binging. She has come for treatment because her eating disorder is interfering with her social life, and she's concerned about her health. She's had a bone scan showing that she has developed osteoporosis, and a blood test showed low potassium level, which can affect the heart. She lives in a small flat near her parents and is not in a relationship. Okay, so what you do, uh, these are the questions you will consider. Um, you um, talk about her current symptoms and whether SSCM is appropriate for her. Uh, then you um, would want to think of developing a target symptom list to work on in treatment and, do, and then do some work on one of those symptoms. So what you do is you establish, it can work with one group of three, but if there's more of you, um, use um, as many as you can, as many as you need. And in each group, the roles are Lucy, the SSM therapist and the observer. Um, and um, the idea is that you all uh, experience all of these uh, roles. So in the first interview, uh, you have 15 minutes for the interview, followed by five minutes feedback from the observer. Observer is very, uh, very important uh, because um, that um, role, um, you've got to be honest and um, a little bit brutal. Did they uh, follow the SSCM guidelines? Um, did they um, do what they said they were doing? And how did how do they think it go? Obviously, be positive about things that uh, went well. And then in the, you do that three times. So in the second 20 minutes, you swap roles. So you um, have the second interview. And in the third um, 20 minutes, you swap roles for the third interview. Then you all meet and discuss the experience of each role, what it was like, and whether you feel you were able to follow SSCM principles and the observers um, of course, you're all observers because you've all done the, done the observer role. Need to comment here. And um, if you want to see me doing um, SSCM, um, I've put this um, uh, this uh, video on YouTube um, with um, Jess, who's um, uh, role playing a uh, patient with bulimia nervosa. I, I um, Gave her the gave her Lucy's um, um, uh, case history and she's um, role played it I think very well and um, I've tried to establish a a, um, a target symptom list and also start to do a little bit of work on uh, on one of the symptoms and thank you very much for your attention and your hard work today. <laughs>